All righty, so welcome to the COVID protocol uh, videos that I have to make here. So uh, let me just share my screen real quick. So basically we're gonna start doing now is focusing now on chapters five through eight. So basically I'm gonna teach all three of these, or four of these basically all at the same time. Um, <clears throat> So I'm not going to follow the same exact structure at which your textbook does. I'm just going to cover it the way that I want to. Uh, but basically, just note that I'm going to be covering all of these chapters basically throughout these videos. I'm going to cut these up into smaller sections of videos, just make it a little bit easier to actually watch them. Uh, yeah. So basically, chapters five through eight. So we're going to start focusing now is we're going to start leaving kinematics because that's what we did during our first exam. And now we're going to start looking at dynamics. So dynamics, again, remember, is the study of why an object actually does what it does. It basically means that the dynamics is then the study of acceleration. So basically, where it does acceleration. So before we can actually start talking about where this thing actually comes from, we have to start talking about something else, which is a force. I'm talking about force. So generically, what's a force? So a force is a push or a pull on an object which is the result of an interaction with another object or with one or more other objects. So this is what we call a force. So a force, again, is some sort of push or pull on an object resulting from some sort of interaction with one or more other objects. And so in general, we're gonna have more than two types of forces or two different classes of forces. So let's look at types of forces or classes of so in general, we have two types. Uh, the first one is what's known as a direct force. So what's a direct force? So a direct force is any force that acts directly onto another object. So for example, my water bottle here, I can hold up my water bottle by applying a force from my hand onto the water bottle, or I can move it to the left, I can move it to the right, I can move it any way that I want to by pushing on it directly. So this is what we call a direct force. So this is a direct interaction between, again, two or more objects. So they are in direct contact with each other. Uh, the second type is what's known as a, a long distance force. So a long distance force is an interaction between two objects, but spatially separated from each other. So they're not at exactly touching each other. So they're not at the same special or spatial location. They are spatially separated from each other. So these are two or more objects interacting via spatial separation. Uh, some examples of this <clears throat> are the, the gravitational force. We'll talk about the gravitational force uh, extensively when it comes to exam number four, but uh, we know that, for example, the Earth rotates about the sun because of the gravitational force. The moon rotates about the Earth because of the gravitational force, uh, etc. So that's the gravitational force. Another example is the electric force. So for example, the hydrogen atoms made from a proton and electron where the electron orbits around the proton because of the, or because of the electric force, not because of the gravitational force. Uh, also magnetic force is another one, which is a long distance force. And then these two together create an electromagnetic force. So this allows you to be able to call your mother, for example. I don't know how awesome this is this because of electromagnetic force. But anyways, these are types of long distance or long ranges forces where there are two or more objects again interacting with each other, but at a spatially separated distance, not right up on top of each other, which is what we call a direct force. 
So basically, now using these ideas of forces, it turns out that Newton laid the groundwork for us to be able to build upon these things. So Newton followed in the footsteps of people like Galileo, who used their observations to basically create now observations, which led to what he calls the three laws of physics. So basically, we're going to start doing now, we're talking about the three laws of physics. And the first one we want to talk about is uh, Newton's first law. Talk about Newton's first law. So what is Newton's first law? So I'll show you some videos here in just a second. I want to talk about those. But basically what the first law says is the following, that uh, an object in motion or at rest continues in its state of motion. Again, meaning in motion or at rest. Unless acted upon by an outside force. So <clears throat> what does this mean? So ultimately, all this means is that what? Anyways, so basically what this means is what? So an object will continue to move in a straight line as long as there is no force acting on it. And an object will stay at rest as long as there's no force acting on it. So let's take a couple of let's take a look at a couple of videos and see what I mean by that. So in this first video here, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to set up a little demonstration. It's gonna be a cup, paper plate on top of it with a very highly expensive the table roll and then a ball on top of that and then basically all i'm going to do is i'm going to smack it okay and then we want to think about what's going to happen to the ball i'm going to ask that in the video as well but basically i'm going to say what happens to the ball is the ball going to go shooting to the side or is it going to stay at rest or is it going to fall what's it going to do so let's think about what it's actually going to do and then i'll show you the video So, what do you think is going to happen when I hit the plate? Ready? One, two, three. Great. So, watching the video, we see is that the ball actually falls down, but initially it stays at rest, right? So, why is that? Well, again, initially the ball is stationary, so it wants to stay stationary. And then when I hit the paper plate, I'm not applying a force to the ball, I'm only applying a force to the paper plate, which causes the paper plate to go flying out. And then, of course, the paper towel roll comes out too because of the friction force between the paper plate and the uh, uh, toilet paper roll. And then the ball then starts to fall because now it's being acted on by a net outside force, which in this case is what we call the gravitational force or its weight. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But basically the ball stays still and it only falls straight down because initially it's at rest and it wants to stay at rest. And so eventually I take away what's called the normal force and then it's allowed to fall down. Now, let's watch another one. So in this one, I'm gonna take a chair and I'm gonna push it. In this case, the chair has some books on it and it's gonna hit the table and then the, we'll watch what happens to the books. Great, so in this case, we can see that the books continue to fly off as if somebody came up and they kicked them across the table, right? But in reality, they don't get kicked, right? So what actually happens is the chair goes and then all of a sudden the chair hits the table and the table causes it to stop and actually rebound backwards while the books go flying forward because they want to stay in the same state at which they were before, which was moving with constant speed. Now, for somebody to say that the books were actually kicked, this is actually wrong. So there is no force which is causing them to go flying forward. The only thing that causes them to go flying forward is the fact that there's minimal friction force between the books and the chair, and the fact that they want to maintain their same speed that they have, which is what causes them to go flying forward. This is the same thing that would happen as if you were driving down the road, 
and you've got your book bag and your passenger seat. And then as you're driving, you slam on the brakes because the light changes in front of you or somebody stops in front of you. And then your book bag goes flying forward. But what it appears is that somebody pushed your books forward and gave it some sort of force, but that's not reality. What's actually reality is that you are experiencing the force in the opposite direction, where in this video here, it was the chair giving a force back in the opposite direction of which it's coming. So the chair then goes into what's called an accelerated reference frame while the books continue moving forward because they are in what's called an inertial reference frame. We'll talk about the distinction in that in just a second. So this brings up kind of the idea of what's called fictitious forces as well. So for somebody to say that the books were kicked or felt some sort of force pushing them forward, and what they were seeing is what's called a fictitious force. So they're seeing something which is manifesting itself as a force, but they can't identify where that force is actually coming from. So this is what we call a fictitious force. <coughs> Pardon me. So we have to be a little bit careful with this. And this is something that our intuition, a lot of times is gonna tell us is actually there, but it's actually not. And this has to do with the fact that in those situations, like we're in the car slamming on the brakes, or when we're sitting in the car and we slam on our gas then, and we feel like we're being pushed back in the seat, nothing is pushing us backwards into the seat. What's actually happening is the seat is pushing us forward, but our body is trying to resist the fact that it's moving forward because it wants to stay at rest. So it feels like it's being pushed backwards when actually being pushed forward. So in these cases, what was happening is that your body is being put into an accelerated reference frame. And we're trying to use the fact that we're in an accelerated reference frame to make judgments on to what's happening around us, i.e. experience the forces. But our mind is tricked and it sees things that's not actually there. Right? So. <clears throat> What does all this mean then for the first law? So let's talk about all of this together and see what the first law actually tells us. So the first thing the first law tells us is that this is the idea of zero force, right? So the first law is also known as the law of zero force, or actually also what's known as the law of inertia where inertia basically just means that an object wants to maintain in its present state, okay? So this is what's long, what inertia tells us. So what the first law basically does in the beginning is establish what zero force means. What zero force means is that the object is going to continue to stay in the state at which it was. So it's either going to be motionless, meaning it has no acceleration, so its initial velocity is equal to its final velocity, or it's gonna move in a straight line. So this is also what's known as straight line motion, so the law of straight line motion. Now, the other thing that the first law also tells us is where and how we can actually use Newton's laws. So this decides or describes to us what conditions can we have to be able to use actually Newton's first law or any Newton's laws, I should say. So all Newton's laws. So basically, where we can use Newton's first law, or where we can use Newton's laws are either in a stationary reference frame, or one that moves at constant speed. So the fact that I can identify then all where the forces are coming from, as long as I'm either stationary or moving at constant speed, dictates the fact that Newton's laws tells us that I can only use then these to fully determine what forces are actually acting on an object. These types of reference frames are what are known as inertial reference frames. So technically, the only place I can actually use a Newton's laws are actually in what's called an inertial reference frame. So one is either moving at a constant speed or at zero speed, which is also a constant speed. Now, where I can't use them are ones where the reference frame 
is accelerant. Um, and these are called non-inertial rankings. So again, going back to the chair slamming into the table and the books flying forward, or you sitting in a car slamming on your gas or slamming on your brakes, these are non inertial reference frames because you now have gone to an accelerated reference frame. Now, the side effect of these accelerated reference frames is the fact that we get what are called uh, fictitious forces. Fictitious forces. So these forces, or fictitious forces, as I said earlier, are ones where we cannot identify where the force is actually coming from. So meaning that, again, if I was looking at the books, the car stops and the books go flying forward. So in this case, I can identify the gravitational force, which is the weight downward. I can identify what's known as the normal force. I'll define that in a little bit. I might have friction force or anything else on there, but I can't identify what throws the books forward because there is no force which is throwing them forward. So they appear to have gotten a force throwing them forward, but I can never identify what it actually was. I couldn't say I walked up and kicked the books or some troll that was living in my seat actually kicked the books. There's nothing I see there that I can identify as the real actual force. So this is what we call a fictitious force. So one of the consequences of a accelerated reference frame or a non-inertial reference frame is these presence of these fictitious forces. Now, again, there'll be times that our intuition or our everyday experience leads us to think about fictitious forces, but these things are not actually true. So <clears throat> in this case, we have to be a little bit careful when it comes to these guys. Now, we won't deal with these directly in class. We just have to make sure that we know that they exist, and sometimes they're going to lead us to uh, problems. But these are topics that we would actually talk about in things like Physics 371. So Physics 371 is what's called analytical mechanics. So we actually would study these fictitious forces in that class. Uh, but as far as uh, this class is concerned, we're not actually going to study them. <laughs> but again, this is what Newton's first law really tells me. So what it tells me is the law of constant motion or the law of straight line motion. So again, some sort of object which doesn't feel a force, therefore is going to move in a straight line and will continue to move in a straight line unless it finally is acted upon by a force. But ultimately what it tells me is where am I allowed to use Newton's laws? In this case, I can only use these laws in inertial reference frames as opposed to non-inertial reference frames. Now, one thing to pay attention to is, is the Earth in an inertial reference frame? Now, we know the Earth is spinning around, and as we talked about before, since it's spinning around, then it has to have a centripetal force, which means, or sorry, not centripetal force, but centripetal acceleration, which means there's an acceleration, which means there has to be a force. We'll talk more about that in a second. But what that means in this case then is since there is an acceleration, we do feel this acceleration. So technically the earth is not an inertial reference frame. Now, the only good thing is though, <laughs> that basically this centripetal acceleration that we feel is actually really small, which means that it turns out that we actually can use the earth as a good approximation for a, uh, an inertial reference frame, but Again, in general, in normal technicalities, uh, it is not an inertial reference frame. It is actually a non-inertial non reference frame. So we have to be a little bit careful with that. But for the most part, when it comes to things like engineering and et cetera, the surface of the Earth is a good enough approximation of a reference, a inertial reference frame that we can actually use it. So this is the first law. So I'll stop here with this video, and then I'll pick up another one when we start talking about the second law.